the guy wogi the guy wenga marago and gumda bienga gumda warangra maramorong tianaganaga maramorong bayalia um wala mata um guri pemo um we're in the subclan lands of the wala wala mata people or the wala people and they're the people of the river and they're a subclan of the kamaragal but they also move all the way around up to paramata so they cover right down the Parramatta River, right down to Buggable and the Lane Cove Valley. And there's several different clans. There's um, four or five, I think, of the Wallamatta. And they have, like here, it's called the Wallamatta Gull. Um, and, uh, and where you are, it's just slightly different. And I used to know the meaning of the Wallamatta. Um, Wallamatta, it, it's got something to do with the forest anyway. I remember that. Um, and this is um, what we would call the dark forest. It was a turpentine forest. It was uh, that wood that's really strong and hard that they use for um, building bridges and building uh, pontoons and, and um, decks in the water because the mangrove worm won't eat it. And they used to use it also for fence posts. And it was really hard and used to blunt their saws. Um, but this was a real dark forest. It was a big forest. And the Bora Ring, actually, there was a Bora Ring sits roughly where we are now on the crest of the hill here. Um, because we're in the highest point. So you can imagine this huge big forest of big tall trees and then it goes down, there was a path that went straight down to the Lanco River which is right behind us and it goes down there and that's where there's a massive midden where you can see that this area when it was used for ceremony because it was so protected. It was protected by this big dark thick forest all the way around and that forest extended all the way to uh, Pass Ride uh, up to Homebush Bay and extended all, almost to Parramatta and then right around to Hornsby. And it was the same type of forest. It was totally different to the Eastern Scleferic Forest, um, which included uh, the Grey Box and the Angophora. This was a total different um, undergrowth. And they were river people. They fed and, and lived off the river here, and, but they were a subgroup of the Camaragal. And that's what uh, is most important. People don't. People think they're totally separate, but they weren't. They were. They were a sister clan to the Camaragal, and uh, very closely associated with them. Yeah. These people were fairly sedentary. Winter time they had stone homes, um, as, uh, as written in several books. In Bruce Pascoe's book, Bruce mentions it. And also there's another fantastic book that comes out of Queensland, University of Queensland. He talks about the stone homes here as well. But these people had stone homes. Now the stone homes were destroyed by the British because when the smallpox spread, our people died in great numbers and they would go into the, into the hut because it was spread in winter time and they would go into the hut um, to look after each other. And unfortunately, um, you know, they, the bodies would die. So when the British came along, they just burned the hut and uh, de get rid of the decomposing bodies, get rid of the smell. Because this was an area that was readily cut for timber. You know, so the lumber was very important and the lumber would be pushed down either in the Parramatta River or in the Lane Cove River and then floated down a city town where the sawmills were. So for the six seasons that you know, we know of, um, the six seasons, they survived and they survived well here. They had the forest to provide all the food in winter time and also they had the summer fruits and they also had the winter crops, the winter foods here. They had along the riverbank, they had vast areas that were dug up for yam. Um, so they had the yam there. They also uh, netted the fish, so they netted the mullet. Uh, I know what the walla matter is. Walla matter is not the forest, it's brim. That's what walla, walla means brim. And walla, they were the brim people because in winter time they had the black brim because the black brim would come up and we associated um, other fish such as the, uh, the bass uh, and other fish that migrate up the river, we associated them as brim. But they're the brim people. So uh, summertime you had the silver brim and the red brim would come in the river and winter time it was the black brim. So they had a ready access to food and then they had the mullet and they had all the other um, fish that would move in as well. And there was three different sorts of mullet in those days. So they had those. They also had the big cod. There used to be huge big river cod. 
gigantic big fish. We'll see they'd catch those and that would feed the whole clan, you know, big feast. Um, they were caught usually in the net or on a line. Um, they had big jew fish um, that we caught mull away. Uh, they'd catch them in the season and they would be caught in winter time as well. Um, the mull away were, were prevalent here all the time. So yeah, they were rural river people. People th seem to think that a cemetery, it's a bad place, it's a yucky place. And it's interesting when you travel around Europe and you see how they destroy cemeteries. Like in Germany, they only keep a cemetery for 15, 20 years, and then they get rid of all the tombstones. So all that money you've invested in a tombstone, they get rid of them, they crush them up, and use it for road base or whatever, or building materials. And then they build either shopping centres or sports fields over the top of the cemetery. And it's quite interesting how the land is reused and it's turned over. And it's very hard to find an old cemetery in Europe. Where here, we tend to have our cemeteries as a, um, you know, a symbol of, uh, of death, but they become untended. And people, you know, families don't come to them anymore. But for us, it's, it's a, a place of, um, of uh, connection because it's, the land has been protected. So there's no buildings, there's no um, motorbikes racing around, there's no, you know, all sp sports grounds also. But um, it's really funny because they either, the Europeans either build a church or they build a cemetery on sacred land. But the main thing is that when we come along, our children come along, the great-great-grandchildren come along in 200 years time, there's still gonna be an Aboriginal presence here because the land hasn't been destroyed. There's still the spirit. The, yeah, the Bora Ring's not, not shown anymore, it's not disclosed, but it's still here under the ground because in most of our Bora Rings, there's a sacred stone that's buried deep and, and they'll still be here. Uh, unless they've been dug out of a grave. If they're dug out of a grave, they'll be laying somewhere or they've been used in a wall or foundation or something somewhere. So they're still here. So there's still the spirit of the land. Um, and that can never be taken away. And as they let more and more trees grow, even though a lot of them are exotic trees, it doesn't matter. Um, we looked at a big gum tree before. That's Biami's tree. You know, and you can see where she sits in the big old grey box tree. Um, and that's what's so beautiful at these places. The ecology is kept to a certain degree, even though, as I said, there's a lot of introduced species. Um, it's still alive and well, yeah. It was a dance ring, and it would have been, um, the way I've been taught about it, it wasn't a secret, sacred site. It was a dance ring where it'd be used, uh, it'd be a main gathering spot. So in the old days in Europe, you had the market square, this was the equivalent to the market square for the Wallamatta. The Wallamatta go up the Lanco River, and, and also you've got the Camaragal um, up around Chats with that. They'd all come here, and then the Wallamatta that go all the way up to Parramatta, they'd all come. This is your centre. So this is your, um, this is your centre where you'd come to talk and, and to share things and, and talk about things and do ceremony. Here, this is consecrated land, um, and same at Gore Hill, and that's why um, it feels positive and feels strong. And same with the other cemetery, just to the north of here. They're well managed, they're, they're looked after. And I keep coming back to that concept of spirituality of the land, the strength of the land. It's strong, it, it's positive. It, um, yeah, it, it's nurturing not only the dead, but the future. Because one of the things about when we bury our dead, <coughs> now normally we'd, we'd cremate our dead, we only bury people of high degree and usually they're buried in the midden, and usually that's a midwife or a woman of high degree. Um, men invariably uh, and young women would be cremated, uh, or most women would be cremated with men, and, uh, and then the ashes would be spread, um, um, and 12 months later what bones were left would be reburned, crushed up and worn on the body. So the, the ash of the body would be totally reinterred. So when you think about here, and you think about how the people are interned, um, it's giving back that energy into the land just like we would for people of high degree. So perhaps that's what it is. But it's definitely keeping the, the borer ring alive. <laughs> <laughs>